We're about to hear from one of our dearest friends who has been so prolific in our lives and the lives of the champions of the faith for literally decades. When you hear his story, I've asked him to share some of his story. It's, it's going to shake you to the core. He has been believing for what we are seeing now for a lifetime and praying to see churches emerge in the presence of Jesus who are committed to the Lord himself and his holy word. And he walked in yesterday and started weeping and said, I've been praying to see this my whole life. And so I believe the Lord, Pastor Tommy Reed is 90 years old. And I believe the Lord is keeping him for the sake of the Lord's church uh, in these last days. So can we all just stand and welcome our dear friend, Bishop Tommy Reed. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Pastor Michael, it is so good to be with you today. I had the privilege a few years ago of holding Jessica in my arms and dedicating her to the Lord. It was a great day. To know what you are today and what you and Michael have done is, uh, is just overwhelming. Let's pray. Lord, we stand here today with no ability to do what we are called to do. There is something happening in our earth today that goes beyond our ability to comprehend for you have come to your church. Our worship is simply a response to your coming. May these next few moments be one in which we hear not from a man but from God. Lord, bless the reading of your word. In Jesus' name, amen. I'm going to do what preachers probably shouldn't do. I want to read to you a rather long passage of scripture. So if you have your iPhone or your iPad or perhaps your Bible, I am old enough to have one of those. Um, Turn with me to the third chapter of the book of Exodus. In this chapter, God comes to a man by the name of Moses. I was thinking this as I was sitting here today of who I preached with when I began my ministry. Uh, to date me a little bit, I grew up and went to Bible school with Bob Schombach, who in his early ministries was the worship leader. In those days, we called him the song leader for A.A. A. Allen. My best friend growing up that we spent our teenage years or our early teenage years together was the man who founded TBN, Paul Crouch. He had lost his father, his father died, as I remember from returning as a missionary to Egypt and died on the way home on the ship. And he was alone. If he got to church, my parents took him. He wore my hand-me-down clothes because there was no money to buy for him. He was my best buddy. And when I think about that and us growing up together, I, I, I have to think, isn't it interesting that God would take a couple of young men who talked to 
we went to church together, but I don't think either one of us were very religious. And to watch what God did with him was amazing. So I stand here today representing a church of the past and yet feel very much a part of the church of the present. So let's read through the third chapter of the book of Moses, the book of Exodus. Now Moses kept the flock of Jethro, his father-in-law. Jethro was a priest of Midian. And he led the flock to the backside of the desert. And he came, interesting statement, to the mountain of God. The place where God revealed himself. The angel of the Lord appeared to Moses in a flame of fire from the midst of a bush. And he looked. And the bush burned with fire, but the bush was not consumed. So Moses said, I will now turn aside and see this great sight. Why is the bush not burning? And when the Lord saw that he turned aside to see, God called him from the midst of the bush and said, Moses, Moses, isn't it interesting God calls our name? And Moses said, here am I. And God said, do not approach. Remove your sandals from off your feet. You're not in church, but the place where you are standing is holy ground. Moreover, God said, I'm the God of your father, the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, the God of Jacob. And Moses hid his face, for he was afraid to look upon God. And the Lord said, I'm very cognizant of what's happening in the world. I've surely seen the affliction of my people. I know they're in Egypt. I've heard their cry on account of their taskmasters. I know their sorrows. God knows all that stuff. Therefore, I've come down to deliver them out of the hand of the Egyptians and to bring them up out of the land to a good and spacious land, to a land flowing with milk and honey, to the place of the Canaanites, the Hittites, the Amorites, the Perizzites, the Jebusites, Therefore, the cry of the children of Israel has come to me. Moreover, I've seen the oppression which the Egyptians are oppressing them. Come now, therefore, I'm going to send you to Pharaoh so that you may bring forth my people, the children of Israel, out of Egypt. And verse 12, certainly I will be with you. Father, bless your word. It is probably totally unusual that a 90-year-old man stands in front of you. If you want to figure the logistics of that, I was born in 1932. In this month of the year, the month of September. A few years ago, I would have never expected to be alive today. And now I'm not sick. I'm perfectly well. I still drive a convertible. Uh -huh. uh, I've got plenty of places to preach because we built several campuses in Buffalo, so they all like the old man to preach. And... Uh, to my surprise and my blessing, Pastor Michael invited me to come and spoke to you. And I, and I wondered what I was supposed to say to you. I felt like going through the audience and saying to you, what would you like me to say? 
What would you like to know about the 1930s or the 1940s? What would you like to know about the healing revivals of 1948? They were pretty neat. Uh, I traveled with my dad in healing crusades. And if you go back to the old Voice of Healing magazines, you will find my face there because we were one of the Voice of Healing evangelists. That's a day you know nothing about. I saw God move then. You see, I grew up and the people who were at Azusa Street discipled my parents. Ruth Fisher Steelberg, her father, was the pastor of Azusa Street. And she and her husband, Wesley, brought my parents to the headquarters of the Assemblies of God because Wesley Steelberg, who was Amy Simple McPherson's youth pastor, became the general superintendent of my denomination, the Assemblies of God. Just a little bit of history. It's kind of interesting, isn't it? And now I stand here today and I want to tell you something. There's a phrase in that scripture that tells us that God came to a mountain where his people were. And he said to them, you will serve God on this mountain of his presence. Very quickly and very succinctly, take a look at that phrase. We have been called to a place of geographic significance. You may be in a big city, you may be in a small town, you may be called to a nation. But every one of you have been called to a place of real estate and you've been placed there to manifest the presence of God. And when God takes you there, this is what he says to you. This piece of ground is holy. I don't really understand that because I had an interesting encounter with a piece of ground. Back in 1962, I was in Korea. I met a young man. His name was Paul Cho. He became my friend. First of all, he was my assigned interpreter. No one had heard from him very much. He had a little church of 200 people. Little did I know that there would come a day when he would build the largest church in the world. I will never forget the point where we were in the Taejon train station because in those days, Korea was largely a bombed out field of buildings that had been torn apart. And in the midst of the torn out buildings, there was a standing train station and there we were, the only restaurant in a large city still left from the bombing. And Brother Cho sat across from my dad and myself. I will never forget my dad, the prophet of God, the man who couldn't preach a sermon. All he could do is stand up and cry. When he stood up and cried, people came to the altar. I tried it with sermons and never worked that good. <laughs> I finally said, Dad, you give the altar call, will you? I can't do anything with these people. And my dad would stand up and tell how he got saved as the son of a saloon keeper and brought up with no one ever taking him to church. They were the days of prohibition when the church had nothing to do with people that owned gin mills and, and restaurants that served beer and hard liquor. And so he never been in a church. One day he went into a little Wesleyan Methodist church with his wife, my mother, a backslidden Pentecostal girl. 
and went to the altar and transformed by the power of God. And I was brought up with the most loving spiritual father that a man could have. I was brought up on the mountain of God in a house where God lived. It wasn't long before my dad felt a call in the ministry and we finally were taken by our denomination, the Assemblies of God. And my dad moved to Springfield, Missouri, where he became the keeper of all of the eating facilities the Assemblies of God owned. And I met a man by the name of W.I. Evans. He had brought my dad to Springfield. He and Wesley Steelberg and Ruth Steelberg, the daughter of the pastor of Azusa Street. And they turned loose all of their feeding facilities to my dad. I watched the executives of that movement come and go and uh, found some of the more real men of the spirit, especially the Steelbergs. It seemed Azusa had done something for that family and their children that made them people of God. I felt like I had come to the mountain of God. I found that there, wherever God has called us, that piece of sacred ground to which God has called you, when you stand in that pulpit and you know you're in God's place, and you wonder why things aren't happening as they ought to happen, the sick are seemingly not being healed, they come to you in prayer and they walk out without being healed, you long to have the altars filled with people and wonder why they don't come. They don't even sit in the pews and everything you've dreamed about seemingly is not happening. Then you meet a Michael Koulianos and a Jessica Koulianos. I remember, you don't mind me being a historian for a moment, do you? I remember the day I met Benny Hinn. I was with David Maines on the 700 Club of Canada, 100 Huntley Street, and he told me about this young man. They all described him as a young man that had uh, an anointing like Catherine Kuhlman. I said, I want to meet him. And I remember when he walked in, he was young, 24 years of age. And when he walked into that room, I knew I was with God. I can say that after knowing him very well, kind of being a spiritual father to him, that Jessica, your, man, your daddy is a real man of God. And I thought, I wonder what a man or a woman of God is really like. And then I realized that was my dad and my mother. When God said, I'm going to come and be where you, where you live will be my abode, that I was brought up like that. You see how I know that is that a miracle happened when I was eight years of age. A polio epidemic was coming across New York State where I lived and across most of America. And I became a victim at first of polio, unable to walk, unable to run anymore, unable to be a normal human being. I wondered if I would spend the rest of my life in a wheelchair. That was my future until one day. I will never forget the days that followed Every time my mother or dad would walk by, I'd reach out and touch them and say, will I always be a cripple? And every time the answer was the same, 
And they would go pick up a Bible and said, no, because God is your healer. And there was that morning when I woke up and all of a sudden I knew it and I felt that I was eight years of age. I recognized that God was in that room that day, but not in the way that I wanted him to be. Would today be the day of my healing? And all of a sudden I knew it from the depths of my spirit, from the top of my head to the sole of my feet. I recognized that this was the day God was going to give me my miracle. And each time my parents would walk by, I thought, how is this going to happen? We didn't even have a telephone in our house. And so I said to my mother, why don't you go next door? Get Mr. Smith's phone and call Pastor Jack Granner and have him come. And I know if he just prays for me today, this will be the day when I will walk. Instantly, she picked up her purse and walked down the street. I don't know why women always call their, carry their purses. They just do it when they go out the door. She carried her purse and went to, down the street to Mr. Smith's house and picked up the phone and called the Granters. And Rose Granter said, uh, I'm sorry, Sister Reed, but... Uh, Brother Granter's in the hospital today in Buffalo, and, and he's visiting all day long. He won't even be back in time before you go to bed. My mother came back and told me he can't come, and everything about it was like the blood drained out of my body. I thought it was the day. I thought it was the day. I thought this is the day. This is what God showed me, and nobody's here to pray for me except my parents. And uh, I guess I didn't think their prayers would work. I don't know what. Anyway, so we've got to have an ordained clergyman to do this stuff. And, and, uh, but he couldn't get there. And I'll never forget the disappointment. I, I felt like the world had just disappeared because my prayer that I prayed, the man I was going to have pray for me when I was healed, he couldn't come. But as... I laid there alone on that couch, wanting to walk desperately. I heard a voice. I don't think it was an audible voice. The movie was made about my story, and, and uh, they picture this voice coming from it. wasn't dramatic at all like this. But all of a sudden, in the depths of my spirit, I heard this thing that said, Brother Granner's not here. But I'm Jesus, and I'm here. And uh, I thought, hey, that's right. <laughs> and all of a sudden, in my little eight-year-old body, something said, if he's here, if Jesus is here, I can be healed today. So I got up the side of my bed and I kind of pushed my leg over the leg that wouldn't work and I pushed myself by the side of the bed. I pushed myself to my feet and I said, I'm going to do this myself. I've, I've heard about people getting out of wheelchairs and walking. I don't think I've ever seen one, but I've heard about these things happening. If this is the day, this is the day. So I pushed myself to the side of the bed, held the bed and I thought, well, I'm going to try it. So I put my first foot forward, my good foot. And then I thought, that's kind of stupid. Because I'm going to have to let go of the bed when I push my bad foot forward. I will never forget my words. I don't know whether they're theologically correct or not. I've prayed a lot of times the same prayer over sick people. I took my little index finger and I stuck it into the devil's face and I said, devil, you are not going to keep Tommy Reed in bed any longer. And then I thought, that's kind of a stupid prayer, but it's the right prayer. And I let go of the bed 
took my first step, but now I'm going to take my second. And I let go of the bed and began to walk. I walked across the floor, hesitantly, slowly at first, picked up the pace and then I looked upstairs to because I had my pajamas on I've got to, if I'm going to go out I better go get dressed and and, and 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 so I looked at it and I said I'm going to go up those stairs now and then, then I had this crazy thought the crazy thought was this I I uh, I don't run upstairs one at a time I always run upstairs two at a time. And if I'm healed, there's no reason I can't do it like I normally do it. I was, my, my mind is going crazy and I said, okay, and so I stepped up two steps and then I stepped up two steps more. I ran upstairs, put my clothes down, came back down, ran out into the, into the kitchen and I looked at my mother and she was cooking something. And she looked up and said, what are you doing walking? <laughs> Never get. what are you doing walking? I said, well, Jesus just healed me. With that, she dropped the pail of the, the, the pot that she was carrying and over the floor spilled the whole pan of milk. I looked at the milk and I said, Mom, I want a glass of milk. Well, she said, if you're going to have to do it, you're going to have to lick it, lip it up from the floor or go to the store and get it. I said, I'll go to the store and get it. In those days, we had a charge account at the little grocery store in town. So I knew I didn't need any money. So I put my coat on, ran out. I think my mother thought I was crazy. Ran out, ran all the way to the store, which was about two blocks away, all the way back. I always like to close this story by saying that I've been walking ever since. And I have known all of my life that Jesus was a healer. I'm here to tell you that this morning. Our Pentecostal gospel, our charismatic gospel, our belief in the supernatural is the truth of this book. There was a day when almost every Pentecostal church in America was filled with people that came out of wheelchairs and every family in the church came because of the healing power of Christ. And ladies and gentlemen, we are about to enter a day of the supernatural. Let me say it again. We are about to enter a day of the supernatural. God is going to do something in the church he has never, ever done before. How do I know that? You just know it. <laughs> now, I've seen God take my life and make it a life of the supernatural. When I was a young evangelist, we went to the mission field. I was in my 20s. I had heard about Bethel Temple, Manila. Bethel Temple Manila began because of a miracle. Lester Sumrall was the pastor. There was a young lady by the name of Clarita Villanueva, the girl known as the girl bitten by devils. She was so demonically possessed that the devils would actually materialize. I don't even understand that. I don't think it's even theologically correct, but somehow they figured out how to do it. They would materialize and they would bite her skin. They put her in Bilibid prison because she had terrorized the millions of people in Manila, Philippines. Lester Sumrall and Bob McAllister turned on their radio one day and heard this scream come across the speakers long before the days of television. And the voice of the radio announcer said, that is the scream that is terrorizing the city of Manila. 
they put her in prison, she would take the prison bars and she would tear them apart and escape again and go screaming through the streets. They'd put her back in prison. God says to Lester Summerall, who became my spiritual mentor, you're to go in that prison and bring her deliverance. He and Bob McAllister went. They prayed for three hours and six hours until he says that the, the sweat, the perspiration in their bodies filled their shoes. And finally, hours later, Clarita stood to her feet and they released her from prison. And it created a revival that built a church of thousands. The city had seen the presence of God. I don't know. There are those that said, I know he believed that it was a demonic force that had tied that city and God brought deliverance to a whole city. And I'm telling you, I pastored that church. That was true. It was a place of miracles. People came in wheelchairs and went out without them. People came in crutches and threw them away. People that were dying of cancer came and were instantly delivered. It was a place of healing. God was in that place because of one miracle of healing. I was there, I can tell you that. I would stand in that pulpit Sunday morning as a 20-some-year-old preacher. We had a, a Filipino pastor by the name of Ruben Condelaria. He was the superintendent of the United Methodist Churches. And somehow through Clarita's miracle, became a Pentecostal. And this great man of God was our Filipino pastor. It was a nation touched by a miracle of God. Hear me. Prophetically, I say this. We are about to experience the greatest revival this nation has ever seen in its history. Number two, I'm here tonight to tell you that this place, this man, this woman has a prophetic word of God for this nation and this world. It will be centered on Jesus Christ, the Savior of the world, the man who died on the cross for the salvation of our sin and is God's only begotten son. And he sits at the right hand of the Father making intercession for the church of America tonight. This is the moment of God. And God has said to me one thing, and I'm going to be very simple. Here is something about this revival. God is where he was in Exodus 3. He looks at our nation. The sin, the debauchery, the false belief systems that are being not only preached and taught by the schools and the churches of America, but by television, everything is pointing to a gospel that is not in this book. He is the deliverer. I can tell you, and I close with this story. I thank God for my parents. My mother was, died when she was in her 40s. She knew God like no other woman that I've ever known knew God in a way that was so intimate. There was a place in our house. We lived in a little home and there were four little bedrooms upstairs. And there was a place between two of the rooms. One was my bedroom my dad made into a print shop, which was a second business he had so we could eat. 
and uh, two doors came together and they would, so my mother between those two doors put an old blanket and that's where she prayed. And I knew that I could walk because of my mother's prayers. I knew that this stuttering, stammering child, I remember the day when my parents had all the executives of the Assemblies of God at their house, and I was in my bedroom trying to sleep with all of these preachers on the other side of the door, and uh, my mother and the wife of one of the general... Uh, the general super, the assistant general superintendent of the Assemblies of God were outside of my door, and I heard that woman say this to my mother. Helen, you tell me your son is going to be a preacher. I'm hearing this. I'm hearing this from a preacher's wife. I'm hearing this from one of the leading pastors of the world out of their house the people that have allegedly seen miracles and I'm hearing her say this to my mother Helen Reed please don't tell your son he's ever going to preach he's too shy he has a stuttering language there's no way he can ever preach the gospel I heard those words and then I heard my mother's response. She said, I understand who my son is today. But I also have seen what God's going to make him. And there will come a day when I will release his tongue. There will come a day when he will no longer be shy. He's going to stand before thousands of people and preach the gospel because God has told me so. And I will tell him what God is going to do with his life. And I want to say to you today, it doesn't matter who you are. It doesn't matter whether you're the most talented preacher in the city. It doesn't matter whether you're the most articulate preacher or not. None of those things have any bearing on who you are in God. Talent or lack of talent is not the issue. Anointing or not anointing is the issue. And I close by saying to you these simple words. I'm 90 years of age by all accounts of our culture, I shouldn't have the ability to stand here. I should be in a casket. But the way the world works, I stand as a miracle, not only of the fact I was healed as a cripple, but just to be here. I'm a miracle. And the Lord, the Lord said to me, tell them you're a prototype. Because what you are in the natural is not what you are in the spirit. It all happened to me one day. I've been a preacher for years. I'd pastored the largest church in the Assemblies of God. And God said to me, I can no longer use you because you don't know the world as I know it. I said, Tommy, unless you begin to see the world as I see it, you can no longer be effective. I said, Lord, what do you mean? The Lord said to me, tell me how you see the world. I said, Lord, it's broken. It's full of sin. I grew up in the home of a family that owned nightclubs all across the city. I understand what sin is. I understand what's happening in the world. 
I could have visited my relatives and sit in bar stools because that's what they do for a living. I understand what the world is. I said, no, you don't. You don't see the world as I see it. Even though you've been there, even though you sat on the bar stools, even though you saw the world as you think you saw it, that's not the world. I said, God, then how am I going to see it? And I heard these words, because I'm going to show it to you. And all of a sudden, as I'm driving my car with this conversation, I don't know whether God does it. I, I converse a lot with God. He talks to me. I hope he does to you. He ought to. I mean, we're preachers. I hope you got there because God talked to you. And uh, as I was driving that car that day, an experience that I will remember to the day I die, it will probably be the last thing I see. It was like God took me as an astronaut and I was looking down at the world and I watched the world spin around and I saw Manila where I used to pastor and I saw Hong Kong where I used to pastor and I, I saw Japan where I've traveled so many times and I saw Honolulu where I was elected the senior pastor and had to say no because God wanted me to come to Buffalo. You try to make that decision. Uh, and uh, I looked and saw the world and it was spinning around and I saw two nail scarred hands that have shaped my life and they grasped the world and the first thing I thought because I had been brought up in the evangelical Pentecostal church and every Sunday night I went to church and heard mostly the same sermon you're going to go to hell I'm going to send the great tribulation to the earth and I'm going to do all these terrible things and God became a pretty big bully in my sight as a kid growing up. I mean, he's going to do all these terrible things to the world and I, so when I, when I looked at the hands, I thought he's going to bring judgment to the world. After all, he died on the cross for them. They've all rejected him. Instead, they were loving and kind and they took the world and they embraced it and he opened it up and inside I thought I would panic for a moment because I saw it inside the world there was one thing a broken heart and God said to me if you see it if you see them as I see them. God understands they're sinners. God understands they were building against God. There's all that in the scripture. But there's another side of it. He loves them so much that he came to die for them because he knows that they're so broken. I want to leave you with this. The world we face, the world we've been called to, is the world that Jesus died for. And I saw them red and yellow and black and white, all broken. And they broke Jesus' heart. That's why he came and died. With that, I went back to the little four-year-old boy that sat by his mother's bed every night to pray. And Helen Gertrude Rice Reed take her Bible and begin to read 
same story every night. Same passage. We never got through it. She would read me how Jesus loved me and he came. And God, the God who created the heavens and the earth, the God who spoke into existence everything that exists, without him there would be nothing but vast emptiness. He created it all. That God. That God came to the earth. And he died for the street people in Manila. And he died for the homeless in Buffalo, New York. And he died for the people of the nations of the world who serve idols. But most of all, he went into a family of saloon keepers by the name of Reed and came and served, saved my daddy who had never been to church and fell in love with Jesus so much that every time you'd mention his name, he'd cry, the prize fighter the professional football player, the tough guy, the guy that could beat, he's an Irishman and had this reputation of being able to beat anybody in any bar of Buffalo in a brawl. And made him into a man with tears. I was raised by the man with the tears. I wonder what it would have been like if I had been raised by the man in the bar. Almost happened. But for God, this morning, this afternoon, I'm here to leave you with one thing. doesn't matter what your name is. doesn't matter whether you have a big ministry or a small ministry. The only thing that matters is whether you know Jesus and you love him. Lord Jesus, I don't have anything else to say except that simple thing. God has sent a prophet among us and a prophetess. They're my friends. And they've invited this old man here. And maybe the old man has a little bit of wisdom, but that doesn't matter much. I am here because I believe in the image of Jesus. And I love you. My dad, my mother taught me how to love you. They, that's all they knew. They weren't professional religious people. They were two people who loved Jesus. And they're in heaven. Jesus, I hope you tell them what I'm doing right now. Because if I could tell anybody in this place that Jesus loves them and loves the world and loves the sinner and loves the alcoholic and loves the prostitute and, and loves the man in the penthouse and the person on the street, Oh God, that's who you are, the God of love. And I want to close with this prayer in my, and this short message, whatever it is and whatever it meant, to say, Jesus, I love you. I love you. 
You've given me a great life. There's probably not another 90-year-old in America that's been preached, called to preach, let alone preach the gospel at this great conference. You've been so good to me. Because like everybody here, you love me. Thank you, Jesus, for being so good and so personal and so caring and so loving that you reached when I was four years of age into a home that was broken, saved my parents until they brought me up in a little bit of heaven where you lived. I thank you, Jesus. God use us. God use us to bring people to know you. In Jesus' name, amen.